Early in 1964, the Cholos Orchestra starred in a short cinema release called The Mood Man, in which my dad reprised the number that he had sung by royal command. My mother and I went to see it as a second feature at the local Odeon. Television appearance had been broadcast in 405 lines of fuzzy black and white. But this was in vivid technicolor. Unlike the Royal Command performance, it was lip synced, but what it lacked in musical veracity, it more than compensated for with energy and surrealism. <laughs> the number opens with a tight shot of hands playing a pair of conga drums and pulls back to reveal a man I recognize to be baritone saxophonist Bill Brown, who I had not previously associated with the playing of Latin percussion. Ross's feature was the reprise of If I Had a Hammer, arranged after the Trini Lopez version, featuring only a rhythm section and massed percussion. The filmmakers had to do something with the rest of the band so the members were arranged around a set, playing various bongos, maracas, gyros, and shakers, rather than their usual trumpets, trombones, and saxophones. Three hapless souls revolved on a small circular yellow podium for the duration of the entire number. Although the camera failed to register what must have been the eventual green of their complexion. My dad was dressed in the same off-white suit that he'd worn at the Prince of Wales Theater, and under which he'd been obliged to wear long underwear after the television director claimed that his flesh could be detected through the thin material once my dad stepped under the television lights, which would be bound to scandalize the royal party. In the movie, he lip-syncs the hell out of the number, miming Hammer of Justice for all he's worth, while the drummer, Kenny Hollick, beats time on a gold sparkle drum kit. The close-ups that come on the repeated line, it's a song about love between my brothers and my sisters and eerie. To behold for the similarity of our facial expressions about this age, and especially when seeing particular words, where my dad holds the advantage over me. I feel like I'm doing this right. Not those are steps where my dad holds the advantage over me in his dance moves. Those are steps. I am yet to master. It is a terrific curio of lost time and a way for me to recapture the thrill of that night in November 63, the morning after the royal show. There was all the excitement of hearing about the backstage scene over breakfast. I tried to play it cool. Did you meet Steptoe and Son? I asked casually. After all, Cholos had a novelty number named after the comedy Rag and Bone Men and Dickie Valentine. Eventually, I couldn't pretend that I really cared whether he'd stood next to Charlie Drake in the presentation line or had shaken hands with the Queen Mum. I blurted out, Did you actually meet the Beatles? It had obviously been a long night or an early morning as my dad wasn't that talkative. He mumbled something about them being very nice lads. Then he reached into his jacket, slung over the back of his chair, and pulled out a sheet of thin airmail paper and handed it to me. I unfolded it. And there were the signatures of all four of the Beatles on one page. 
I'd see reproductions of their signatures in enough magazines and fan club literature to know that these appeared to be the real thing. The ink seemed barely dry. What I did next would bring tears to the eyes of those who make a fetish of such objects. But I had only a small autograph book, and the paper was too large to be mounted in it. I carefully, if not so very carefully, cut around each of the signatures, lapping off the E of the in the Beatles and pasting the four regular scraps of paper into my album. You might say it was me that broke up the Beatles. And it only took a pair of scissors.